beautiful image against this silence. Wonderful. Liebe Schielerinnen, liebe Schieler, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear Sriram, and of course, dear Thomas, a very warm welcome to this night's edition of the campus lecture, Rocket Science Meets Life Sciences. My name is Nelly, I'm a communicator at Novartis, and I'm not even trying to hide my excitement about this lecture tonight, because it's, to be honest, it's not your usual every day to use rocket science in its original context. I would usually have it in my vocabulary to describe what something isn't. As in, come on guys, let's do it, it's not rocket science. But tonight it is rocket science. <laughs> we see rocket science. For those of you, and I've seen familiar faces, who are regulars to our campus lectures, we're doing them actually for more than a decade now, you will have upon registration realized that we did things slightly differently this time. So first of all, we asked for your language preference. I couldn't resist myself when Thomas on his website says, I'm doing lectures in Swiss German, German and English. So as you might have realized by now, the votes, and we love to vote in Switzerland, they went towards English. So hence I'm speaking English. However, the close runner up, and as a research company, we want to share the results, was indeed Swiss German. So that would have been fun too. We also had this open text field where you were able to send us questions that you have for Dr. Z. Spoiler alert, the questions are really strong. I was having a lot of fun digesting the questions. Thomas hasn't seen them yet, I promise now. Jo, stay tuned. However, before we get to the questions, we will. And I think that the questions, what's important to mention is that they were on your particular wish. Um, that we changed because you challenged our models of how we do lectures. He said like, well, by nature, I'm more interested in the unknown than the known. The known is his own presentations. The unknown are your questions. So hence, we wanted to build in more time for your questions. But before we get to that exciting part, we do indeed have a concise presentation by yourself. And even before that, I hope you can stay with me on going backwards on the agenda. We have our very own Novartist, dear Sriram, who will um, give us a little address, Sri Ram? Sure. No, 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 you have to wait. I'll give an introduction. <laughs> I'll give an introduction and then I'll, or you can join me for the introduction on stage, as you wish. Sri Ram is our, I, because I practice really hard. It's not an easy bio and it's a humbling bio. Sri Ram is our president development. He is also our chief medical officer. And in a nutshell, so I had to understand what he does. He described it himself very well. He, his team turns molecules into medicine. Quite a big role there. Sriram has joined us in this very role only last year, but there is actually a two decade long gig with the company that dates back to 1999, which is impressive as well. And before, turning his career to life sciences, he was a physician in the US, specialized as a transplant nephrologist. That's the moment you get on stage for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Good evening, everyone. It's a great, great privilege to be with you all here and to welcome you to our campus lecture. I'm gonna take you back many decades and think of a Four-year-old boy, you're much older, I know that. Four-year-old boy on a tin roof in a small uh, city in India named called Pune on a full moon night looking up at the moon with my mother and having a curious conversation about what is it that I see. I did not see anything much very profound. I, I think I saw a bunny. I saw a bunny, the shape of the moon, and the, the craters, I think, were like a bunny. Uh, but it was an important moment for me that I remember because it symbolizes for me the fundamental nature of human curiosity and something that we all start with as children and in different ways go about learning things about what we, know, what we don't know. And the curiosity about space, perhaps triggered by the first awareness of 
the moon, which perhaps is one of the closest objects, I guess the closest object to us in space, followed then by the journey that makes you think about science and stars and how they work. And for me personally, a very vivid memory of then a few years later, becoming aware of the landing, the first landing of a human on the surface of the moon. I remember being very proudly being asked to mimic what Armstrong means uh, as a little child. <laughs> but, but that memory combined with the word NASA for a young child in India <coughs> represented something completely awe-inspiring. That NASA is the place where the people, where people planned how they were gonna get a human on the moon, and they did. So for me to be here in the room with somebody who comes from that institution in the role that, and I know that Nelly will speak about it, is a truly special privilege. The, of course, my own journey after that evolved in a different direction. Uh, and as I started pursuing life sciences, and if I fast forward a lot, and Nelly, you took people back and forth in time, I want to say that I also feel very honored that, and very special that I stand here having come from India as a country, where we, India recently managed to soft land uh, a craft on the moon, Chandrayaan-3, and, and, and the idea of what's possible and, and what, how you can make dreams come true uh, became a reality once again as, as, I, as I read that news. I, I, was, I was also curious to learn that in, in speaking about the Apollo missions, which were, of course, a big part of my childhood, that the Novartis predecessor companies made their own contributions to those missions, with uh, Geigy having developed Tinuvin P, which was the UV absorbing layer, I guess, that was on the visors of the, of the astronauts that went into space and that was highly essential for them to be able to do that safely. And, 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 and Siba having supplied araldite, which is the very special glue that held different parts and different layers as well as a filler in the spacecraft. Uh, when I learned about araldite, my mind also went back to the fact that of the power of really extraordinary products, because I remembered as a child using araldite as the thing that pretty much could glue anything together, <laughs> especially a vase that you happen to have broken and you shouldn't have. <laughs> it was a pretty miraculous thing. But I think, I think as I've thought about this idea of what it takes to be curious and do complex things and pursue knowledge, uh, I want to just leave you with, with three thoughts. That there are some things that are common about you know, what you call the pursuit of rocket science and space science and life sciences, where first, None of it is possible without deep collaboration and partnerships amongst people. We at Novartis talk about it as reimagining medicine together. And it takes a lot of work with a lot of experts coming together and collaborating together to make things happen. You have to have the ability to rapidly learn, learn from mistakes and iterate when you don't get things right. And that's also a part of our journey. We, we do that all day, every day. And then finally, persistence and patience. None of this is easy work, nothing comes easy. There's nothing insta about it. It's, it takes time, it takes a decade. It takes to make a molecule of medicine like you described, Nelly. It takes 10 years of a journey of many things to be done before we can say that we have generated the evidence that allows us to make something a medicine. And similarly, I'm sure we'll learn that when we think about something like the James Webb Telescope, the idea of putting this amazing telescope into space takes many years of planning and execution with a lot of experts over time. So, I'm just gonna leave you with the one last thing that I'm thinking about, which is I take great pride in that I have the hobby of photography, in which I use a little camera to be able to record a present moment in time for posterity. And I'm really now looking forward to being transported into something that takes images that actually tell us what has been happening pretty much since the start of time as we know it, I suspect. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Nelly. But welcome all. Thank you so much, Sriram. So here I'm left with the next humbling bio. Dr. Z, I love the name by the way, Dr. Z is a Swiss-American astrophysicist, leader, and innovator. 
He was the longest continually serving head of science at NASA, the leading program worldwide for doing science in and from space. I'm repeating this because I had to read it several times. I think it, there's something beautiful in this sentence for doing science in and from space. Dr. Z was born in Switzerland, became the first college graduate in his family, studied physics at the University of Bern, and was awarded his PhD in 1996. For the artists in the room, that's when the company was founded. The same very year, he left Switzerland for the US and joined the University of Michigan as a research associate, where he later was made professor of space science and aerospace engineering. He's though not only known for his scientific work, but also for his work on innovation and entrepreneurship. And I take it that I'm probably not the only one who has followed you on podcasts, Netflix, wherever we see you coming up. After spending now all his professional life thus far in the US, Thomas has his very, this very August started as the director the ETH space, and we have him back in Switzerland. Thomas, the stage is yours. Well, I'm uh, so glad uh, that you all came out tonight. Many of you voluntarily, and some of you said, uh, hey, you need to be here, right? No. I'm just so glad you're here. Uh, and I ask specifically that young people are in the front because I expect all the questions from the first three rows. Uh, so uh, so that, that's what's going to happen. Look, um, uh, I offered up three languages. I, I have to tell you, I'm not, I don't speak a single language without accent. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it, it, it's terrible. And if I added French, it's even worse. Uh, you couldn't even tell uh, what language I'm trying to speak. So, uh, so, uh, so I'm, I'm excited that I can uh, speak English because a lot of uh, the words uh, are easier in English than they are elsewhere. Uh, Somebody is my translator, you, right? So, uh, so I said, if you don't speak a word, hand up, and I'll quickly translate it into German. So I want to make sure we're not getting lost because of a word. Does that, does that make sense? So uh, what I thought I'll do uh, today is really tell you a story, a story roughly 20 minutes and then we'll go into a Q&A. And it's kind of a story uh, that's really two stories. Uh, one of them is a personal story, uh, just like uh, you said before. So many of us look back at kind of dreams we had and uh, kind of where we ended up. Uh, the second story is one of a telescope. Uh, it's actually the most complicated telescope ever built, the biggest space telescope ever. And uh, frankly, it's a telescope that's uh, built for a specific purpose, which is to look back in time. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of introduce what I mean with that, and then kind of tell you the story going forward. Does that make sense? All right, to start the first story, uh, this is uh, how it looks where I grew up, especially in spring or in fall when Toon is in the fog. And uh, so every time I went to school, I went into the fog. And I'm like, why? I'm not staying here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, so you see the beautiful mountains. And you know, when I look at this, it's like, wow, this is uh, geology happening right now as we speak. Uh, you know, each one of the, of the Alps are folding up two to three millimeters per year still. Erosion is taking that stuff off. But it's nature, powerful nature right there, kind of in a way that's really hard to find elsewhere. But for me, what really was exciting as a kid is looking above the mountains. What's really interesting, especially when there's fog, there's no light coming up from the valley. And so what you see is the stars in a really profound and amazing way. It's actually harder uh, to see constellations there because there's so many stars. In fact, uh, what you could see is of the order 6,000 stars or so during a dark night. You also see that there's a, a band of bright stars kind of going across the sky. The band, of course, rotates as uh, the Earth rotates uh, around. And uh, the band, uh, of, of course, as you know, are, is a galaxy. Uh, this is a galaxy, by the way, here, uh, seeing from the side. It's a galaxy. Uh, by the way, uh, here's a galaxy looking down on top. Uh, by, all of these, by the way, are galaxies. Uh, so each one of those. Uh, each one of that band that I'm sitting in uh, is basically looking in the dish of the galaxy, kind of, so to say. 
And if you added up all the stars in our own galaxy, it's of the order of 400 billion stars. So a lot of stars. So kind of everything I see with my naked eyes uh, are stars. And I think that's amazing. I, I thought when I was as a kid, uh, kind of, uh, you may or may not uh, know, I grew up uh, in this tiny village, uh, less than 500 people. I also grew up in a kind of in a religious environment in which I was actually not allowed to go to sports, which I love still to this day. I was not allowed to go beyond it. So for me, the sky was like the anchor to the world, always. But so I saw this galaxy, and I saw the stars, and I always wondered how it would be to look at the stars elsewhere from somewhere else. Now, I want to just quickly hang on kind of the, the, the topics that I talked about. Remember, the Earth is going around the sun, uh, and, uh, and uh, there's a few planets. We can argue how many, Pluto or not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, each one of the stars that you're looking at, you know, the 6,000 from here, but the, the you know, 400 billion stars, uh, on the average, each one of them has a planet. We know that since eight years. Uh, we did not know that before. When I went to school, they said, Every 10 stars on the average have one planet. So there's many more planets than we thought. Now what's interesting, at the beginning of the 20th century was the first observation of an other galaxy other than ours. So think of the galaxy as a massive bus full of stars. And somebody said, hey, there's other galaxies. And this guy, Hubble, started discovering other, other galaxies. And in fact, the picture that you just stared at from the beginning. Each one of those points, each one of them is another galaxy. So I want to tell you, there is more galaxies than stars in our Milky Way. And we only learned that relatively recently. So what I'm going to talk about is stars, then I'm going to turn about galaxies, then I'm going to ask, where did the first galaxy start? So that's the journey I'm going to take you on. I just want to make sure that we talk a little bit of science, just so you know the three uh, positions I'm going to go through. All right. So uh, up there, I look at the stars. And, uh, and I, uh, as, as it was said, I, I, you know, if I, I, you know what, what they do in Switzerland, which was beautiful for me, they do this questionnaire to figure out what job you should have. You know, like a questionnaire, and they propose, like, what job should you have? And what came out with me is scientist or engineer. The only problem was I didn't know a scientist and I didn't know an engineer. Uh, most people around me were farmers or working with farmers. And so basically I went to gymnasium because I thought that that's cool, let's try that. And, and, and for me, I, I always loved nature. I took over the library when I was a little kid and started reading left to right, uh, especially in science and in exploration, also in history. And there was this one kind of the stories that Imagine, kind of, I, I just were mind boggling to me. It's a story that, story for the low resolution, usually it's not that visible. I couldn't, can't find a better resolution. Of course, this is an artistic picture of Galileo Galilei. Galileo got a little tube, kind of, with lenses in it from Amsterdam that was used there, kind of, as a novelty. Like, it's kind of cool, it brings the neighborhood closer. And, he, and what he said is, like, oh, I'm gonna start observing into the sky. Remember, that's during a time where kind of all the bosses on Earth, the religious ones and the non-religious ones, all said, I'm not only a boss on Earth, I'm the boss of the universe. <coughs> because the Earth is in the center of the universe. And so what he did is he, he pointed the telescope towards Jupiter. And what we found, you see the hand written uh, things there at the, at the bottom. What he found is there were celestial objects around Jupiter that moved. Every time he looked, they were at a different place. It was really clear they were in the orbit around Jupiter. And uh, what Copernicus did not do, he did. He started talking about it. Copernicus, even though he was the first guy to think about that, only published his major work on his deathbed because he knew it's a really dangerous thing. Giordano Bruno talked about it, did not end up well for him. You know the history. So Galileo put that out and started talking about the fact, hey, look, there, you know, there, Jupiter is really the center. And for me, I always wondered, how does that feel? See, if you have an apparatus, 
You look at the universe and you learn about the universe in a way that nobody has ever seen it. I always thought about how that would be, and that's really the story. That happened to me. And so, uh, so basically, of course, what happened to me is not looking at Jupiter. We, you can take picture of Jupiter, and actually, the, it, it's not hard to find the moons of Jupiter, even with a Faustacher. So it's not not even a telescope. <laughs> so, uh, so, so for me, uh, so for me, uh, what we want to do is look into the deep universe. Now. The challenges, and I already told you, there's many stars here, so kind of, we're not interested in, there's, we're going to look about our own stars, but that's not the major reason. We're going to look past that to all the universe. Now, the one thing that Hubble figured out early on is that the universe, if you look at galaxies, no matter which direction you look, the galaxies are flying away from you. And you say, how can I figure that out? Well, it turns out one of the things that quite is a mystery it's miraculous that basically the entire universe is made out of the same stuff. The atoms in your body, the atoms in the air, the atoms in the sun, they're the same atoms in the whole universe. So once you find hydrogen, for example, which is the most abundant atom, you can figure out how it radiates. And when it's moving away from you, that radiation changes, just like the ambulance going by you changes the tone. So because of that change of tone, because of that change of light, you see it's moving. So, so the point is, we want to look at these galaxies, and especially the first generation of galaxies, way back at the beginning of time. How do you find the beginning of time? So you say, I told everything is running away from you. You can say, how about we turn the clock around? How long until it's all together? The answer is 13.8 billion years. That's the age of the universe. By the way, there's four different ways of measuring that. It's a very, very good idea to, uh, to uh, look that up. I don't have time but, uh, to, to explain all four of them. But the point is, it, just take the age of the universe, just like, I don't know what your age is. The way your age, you know what it is. The age of the universe, 13.8 billion years. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, what we do. So build a telescope. And a telescope that was in trouble really quickly. A telescope that to see back in time, uh, you need to have two things. If you look at something really, really far away, you need a big mirror, right? Because you need to see, collect a lot of light. If you look at something up close, you know your iPhone is good enough, the camera. If you want to see farther back, you need a better camera. That's why you know, some people walk around with uh, fancy cameras. So you need a big mirror. The mirror that you see there is six and a half meters. Uh, a Hubble Space Telescope, every telescope done so far is 2.2 and a half meters, which is from my toes to my hand, roughly. That's the max size. Six and a half meters is three times that. It's so big it doesn't fit into a, a rocket. So you need to go, you remember the Transformer movies when you fold everything up like a car, and then it's a monster. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so it's basically that you need to unfold the mirror. Now, the other problem is, because of the fact that the universe expands so much, even though it emitted all its light, invisible light, because of the light moving away from us, it turns red. And it's turning from light into infrared. Now, infrared, you can detect infrared, but not with your eyes, with your skin. If you're at the campfire in, in summer, you feel the heat on your skin. That's infrared radiation. So kind of the sensors we have to build is one that has a big mirror and is really cold so we could measure the faint heat signals from the deep universe. And you see, NASA got in deep trouble. I started, and uh, frankly, within a year, I need to be there. See in front there, I'm sitting. I know it's a fuzzy me in front of the uh, in front of Congress, that's not comfortable. I just want to tell you, uh, by the way, a lot of these mistakes that were talked about, the screws and washers that were falling off, uh, were mistakes that, uh, that happened before I was there. But I, was, uh, I, was, I found the problems, and I was being beat up. And that, that's fine. Uh, frankly, uh, what happened, of course, it's not that the people were stupid. What happened is we had uh, a team that 
did not come together as one. They don't try the best. It's like in athletics. That you can have amazing, I don't want to talk about uh, FC Basel right now, but, <laughs> but, but, but you, you could have, uh, we can talk about FC Basel 10 years ago, but, uh, but you could have an amazing team of great players and they lose every game because they're not a team. That's the problem I had. I had amazing players, but they were not a team. And so basically what I had to do is, is kind of take it to the gym and, uh, and what happened is we had to uh, turn it around. Now the team from the beginning had some of the best people. Some of the people, frankly, so good. Uh, there's uh, kind of the test I always made when somebody came to me with a mission. I basically tried to figure out how many questions I need to ask until they no longer know the answer. And I prepared myself from it. And there's this one guy, after six questions, I was so embarrassed, I said, I'll stop. <laughs> I could literally not get to the end of what he knew. They, was, they were there, amazing people, from multiple continents, men, women, that got, brought their best. Here's a model of the telescope next to these people. And I just want to tell you, if you want to do something, I don't know what your passion is going to be. You want to do th something amazing like you're doing, kind of saving lives. Uh, the unit that's doing that is not one person, not me, sorry, not you. It's teams that do that. And so for me, that's one of the most important insights that are happening. And what often happens is the question is, if you make a mistake, what do you do? If you see a mistake, what do you do? And if you make a mistake, what you want to do is talk about it. Because you want somebody else to fix it. If you see a mistake, it's like, hey, uh, is that really what you intended to do? You want to have the environment in which you can do that without the other person being offended. That's a great team. It's not. We all make mistakes, but I want my brother, my sister next to me to catch me. My colleague, I want them to find my mistake. That's what great teams are, and that's, uh, that's what we learned. So there we were, finally, after all that. We turned the telescope around. We were on top uh, uh, in Christmas Day uh, 20, uh, 2021. Uh, by the way, the, the two guys with the blue shirts are both Swiss. So we solved a lot of problems in Swiss German. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other guy is French, uh, so this is the, the white guy, uh, the white shirt guy is the, uh, is the head of the, the rocket company. The, the other guy, who's not me, is the head of the European Space Agency rocket program. And so I took the picture and I turned around and told everybody, hey, uh, let's take that picture because if the rocket goes into the water, these are the jobs that are becoming free uh, that, that, that evening. <laughs> And so, so basically, uh, so we were there, and after all this agonizing thing, all the turns around, COVID and everything, there we were, and I should be part now of this rocket launch. Standing by for terminal count. A to the DDO, attention for the final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two unités, top. And we have engine start. And liftoff. Décollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. I want to tell you, I still get nervous watching that. I just really hope the movie ends the way I remember. <laughs> uh, because what happened is the rocket went up there. There's never been a rocket with a more expensive payload on it in the history of space flight. Um, and and so, so basically what happened, this is the last time we saw the telescope. See, it's all bundled up, all together, and it's moving away. And you see there in the insert, you see us kind of celebrating as it's going away. And what happened is the entire road, it's me and the head of the, Europe, uh, the European Space Agency, an Austrian, and we always talk about uh, Klummer and uh, Heine Hemme and all these other people, and uh, Müller. Uh, so, so we always talk about them. But, but the, the overall, uh, uh, so we saw the telescope going away. And the only reason the, t the camera was up there that you're looking at is because we had a problem. So we wanted to make sure that if the problem happens again, we could see it. And what happened on this Christmas day, uh, the first, uh, that kind of surprisingly, uh, after we launched successfully, uh, all of a sudden, we saw that the solar panels were coming out. 
the power system of the entire telescope, and everybody in my role was in tears because everybody had been hoping uh, for that to happen for so and so many years. The problem was, usually after you launch, 80% of all the risks are done, and now you have a mission we know how to handle, not on this one. Uh, on this one, now you need to unfold the transformer. And so for that, 344 things need to happen, every one of them perfectly. If it doesn't, any one of them, the whole telescope is useless. And so the first January it was a really stressful January uh, as this was being set up. Uh, now I want to tell you, remember how I told you how the team struggled? The team beat everybody's expectation in how fast they deployed that. So we built a, a team that struggled. We had a team that was winning, winning so, so well that better than they ever expected themselves. The whole thing was unfolded and we saw the universe. And I want to show you two, three images of the universe before we get into Q&A. Because I started at Jupiter with Galileo, I'm going to tell you, show you Jupiter so you get a, a feeling. This is, of course, in our solar system. Uh, it takes roughly an hour for light to get from Jupiter to us, order of magnitude. And you see Jupiter is, uh, you know, it has some bright spots. Do you see how the polar regions are bright? Why do you think that is? What's in the polar regions? Snow. Haha. <laughs> okay. It's not snow. It's remember, hot is hot is bright in this, right? It's uh, it's yeah. So what else? What could it be in the polar regions? Northern lights, aurora, right? Remember how like if you look north, kind of the northern lights, uh, they happen there. The particles are raining down of them. Do you see the storm there that looks like a hurricane that? That is there, and it's rubbing against the environment, and it's hot. And you see that there's a ring around Jupiter. Do you see that? That's a failed moon. Like everybody says, Saturn has rings. Well, Jupiter too. By the way, Uranus also. So, so, so the point is, immediately we look at this neighboring planet, and we see a new planet, new science. But now look into the galaxy. This is in our own galaxy. Uh, the way I would describe this, it's a nebula. So the light took 7,200 years to come to us. Uh, so it has been out there. It's a Carina Nebula. And what I want you to look at is these structures. So think of that as a hospital, a star hospital. All the brownish, yellowish stuff are stars that came to the end of life and shed their environment. Every atom in your body has at least, is at least a billion years old when it came from that kind of process. Stars that shed their environment. So you see stars, and by the way, not just atoms, molecules, much more complex organic molecules than we ever thought before we see there. And then you see all these stars, tiny little bright things. Those are baby stars that are forming in the environment of these shedded old star materials. So that's in our own galaxy, a, a star that's out there form a kind of an environment forming many, many more stars. Now, what I want to do is take you on a journey. And we're going to look somewhere in the sky. And just we could look pretty much anywhere. You've looked at this picture before. Now, let me tell you, if you took a grain of sand onto your hand and you stretched it out against the dark part of a sky, you get to kind of a picture that you've been looking at as we're sitting here. And I'm showing you how small it is in there. In that picture are of the order 6,000 galaxies. Uh, there are two, there's uh, some stars, you know, all these etchy things like these. They're stars that are nearby. Everything else is a galaxy. So you see this environment deep into the universe. Nobody has ever seen that far back in time. And I want to uh, draw your attention to one of these spots, um, one of these spots that are, that are, I'm going to just zoom into it. Uh, many, all of these galaxies, we can go measure the time. But that first picture, that little, little reddish thing, the light has been on the way from the beginning of that galaxy to us for 13.1 billion years before we observed it. So for me, the first time we looked at the universe, we broke, with that camera, we broke every record. We saw deeper than we ever expected. Remember, 13.8 billion years is the age of the universe, so it's clearly the first generation universe. What we figured out in the meantime is that 
even in some of these very, very early galaxies, in the middle of them are ginormous black holes. Black holes, by the way, when I was your age, were ideas from some scientists. In the meantime, we've imaged them. They're horizon. We actually know where they are. They're in the center of galaxies. And we always thought that black holes are kind of at the end of when a galaxy evolves, there's a black hole. The earliest galaxies, this one is 13.2 billion years old, already has a black hole in it. The idea I'm trying to give you, uh, give you uh, with this, uh, the kind of thought I want to leave you with is, I don't know what it is that excites you about what you could be doing with your life, about kind of the, the things that are on your mind that are worth doing. Uh, the one thing I want to tell you that I learned uh, working on a James Webb Space Telescope, I'm a lot more optimistic than I ever was. Because this is really, really, really hard, and it looked very hopeless. And here I am in this amazing auditorium showing you images of the universe nobody ever saw that people like you and I, with mistakes, with weaknesses, made happen because they worked together and they never gave up hope. Thank you so much. I've never seen more impressive visuals in this auditorium, and I spent some hours here. So thank, thank you so much. A very obvious question that came to mind to, to, to kick it off. How was the secret sauce that you applied to actually get individual talents to form a team? Because he said, and, and, and then you saw all these bright people, but they weren't working together. The one picture, team picture, but what did you do to bring them, glue them together as a team? So there's like um, two or three uh, lessons that I learned about building teams. So the first one is the best teams are built by people who are not the same yep. to each other. I, I actually, like I'm, a, I'm almost too fearless uh, in a team. I'm like, let's go try. And I need somebody next to me who says, stand by, let's, <laughs> let's talk about it. I'm much better if somebody's next to me who says, let's think about it. And often uh, uh, there are good, I mean, there was news today about the, the, the deepest optical um, communication ever done from space today uh, was in the news. I remember the only reason that happened is because somebody stopped me. I wanted to kill that idea because I thought it would not work, and somebody says, you're wrong, and I listen to her, and I'm gonna call her and say, because of you, it's there. So it's so kind of, for me, again, it's about people who are not the same, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, it actually takes effort to build a team, and you need to invest in it. So kind of my point is, you need to be able to take in the time with the team, uh, you need to trust the team, and uh, what that means is, uh, you don't just stand there and pound the table. Uh, you actually say, hey, look, we need to be successful. What, what are you bringing to it? What am I bringing to it? In which way, what is my role? What is yours? I think the third thing is just really focused on trust. Uh, what I did with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, you know, the company that built that deployment, um, they struggled. That's where the screws came off. Uh, the guy was in charge, uh, always told me it's fine. And I knew it's not fine. Either he lied to me or he didn't know, and neither is good. Uh, once he left his job, involuntarily, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, guy, the guy who came, by the way, I, that's the last resort. You never start there, but, but uh, that's the last resort. The guy who came, I basically said, let's just agree we'll share all the worries with each other. We were on the phone pretty much every week, yeah. and everybody knew, we're we told everybody, we're friends. Like, I literally like the guy. I, we were on the phone together, and that trust, uh, basically, we never let anything come be between us. And the whole organization, you know, there is no incentive. So that kind of trust play, like, yes, you have to work at the team, like, really kind of grind through it, because it's hard. But at the end, I will trust you before you've even earned my trust. I will mm -hmm. pay into the trust account before you've, you've deserved it. And I, I want you to do the same. 
And over time, it will pay off. So that's the third element. So how are you going to do this? I have all some of your questions here that were submitted, brilliant questions. I'll kick it off with five, six of those, and then we would open up in the auditorium. So there's people with microphones. You can already think about your questions. I'll start now. You see there's some questions. Oh, good. You haven't seen them. Can't wait. <laughs> would you have liked to personally become an astronaut? I never wanted to. And a simple reason for that at the beginning is it, took, it takes five years of training, and then somebody gives you a sheet like this, you need to do exactly what they're telling you. And I'm like, that's just not who I am. I prefer figuring out things myself, improvising. And it's different today. If somebody asked me today, I would do it. Because everything has changed. You can now go into space with uh, two, three months of training. And, uh, and uh, it's far less driven now, top down, especially once we go to the moon. So if somebody asked me now, wanna give me a, if he wanted to give me a ticket, I'm like, thank you so much, I'll do it. I'll I don't make it. enough money. I'll think that, about uh, it. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not at the beginning, yeah. I'm reading this question, so it says simple question, and that's what the person has submitted. Not, I'm not adding this, right? Simple question, why are rockets launched at 90 degrees angle? Why not at 45 degrees like a ballistic projectile? So basically what, what the trick is with a rocket, um, you want to get away from gravity as fast as you can. And it's actually easier to stabilize the rocket on the way up kind of 90 degrees. Because see what happens is uh, a Lisman Nadler or something like that. As get off, that's really, <laughs> like it's like think of a rocket as that. It wants to fall. So you want to control the rocket faster than it can fall. Now the one thing, if you've ever been at a rocket launch, and I sh should go back, you see it there. Within like 20 seconds, you turn. So it's like you go up and immediately pitch. So, so yes, you go 90 degrees, but the person who asked the question is very smart because you immediately go, uh, it's not exactly 45 degrees, but you, you pitch in a different direction really, really quickly. So at the beginning, you do it because of stability. Once you have enough energy, you go okay. pitch, and then you go uh, and take all the energy you can with you. Here's a tough one for you. Considering the research budget, and its allocation. If you were to reallocate it in hindsight, what changes would you have made? Hmm. I felt that the most important budget that we had was actually the thing that made the least news, which is kind of developing entirely new technologies and kind of doing fundamental science that moved us forward. And I've always felt that I struggled, even though I spent a lot of time talking to Congress and to, uh, to people kind of selling that, because uh, kind of in many ways, the seed corn of innovation uh, turns out to be, it's kind of hard to sell that, but it, it turns out to be well. So I would have taken probably a larger fraction of that. And also a more aggressive stand, kind of a part of that, just like, like let's only do like massive, crazy ideas with some of it. Because some of these crazy ideas today are SpaceX now. Yeah. Like, it, that was really crazy. The vast majority of people, all the experts said that will not work, the mass majority of experts. So I just felt we needed a little bit more crazy. A little bit more crazy. That sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. <laughs> Which success factors in space sciences do you think could also help drug discovery? Well. I mean, I think uh, you actually, in my opinion, you, you said it in your talk, I entirely believe uh, that you got it right. Uh, kind of it's about uh, the success factors of building the right teams kind of around a vision that is uh, very life-changing. I always thought like drug discovery and, and kind of working in life science, just an amazing subject area because it affects your family. Like, uh, you know, I mean, many people, like, of course, both of my parents died of cancer, unfortunately. But look at what happened to cancer survival rates in the last 20 years. That is incredible. There's many people 20 years ago that would have, it was a, a clear death sentence. The majority of them live today because of the amazing work that happens in companies like this one. And no, I'm not being paid to say that. I mean, because for me, I just really, I mean, frankly, we, we, I just really believe in that, you know, and, and it's kind of part of it is also that kind of, crazy idea of new 
new ways of doing things, but part of it is just grinding it out, the patience that you talked about as part of a team. So they're all the same. These kind of success factors that he talked about, I would have signed my name underneath it. He Fast. agrees. <laughs> he agrees. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one thing, the one question that you would personally like to see answered by the James Webb Space Telescope? If I had a wish, yes. um, what I'd really like to see is uh, atmospheres of a few Earth-like planets that have signatures in them that are clear signatures of life there. There is a non-zero chance that that can happen. Uh, What's a non-zero chance? It's, it's larger than zero. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you're saying there is there definitely is life. We're going to find it. The question well, is when. So kind of, the, I'm just saying that the tool set is such that that's possible. Now, you should know that James Webb Space Telescope was invented before we had discovered other planets outside of the solar system. So it, we actually, it's not a tool that ideally is set up to measure life on planets like ours. It's the wrong tool for that. But nonetheless, we already have found planets around kind of odd stars, not like the sun, but we found planets that look oddly convincingly uh, kind of similar to us. And so for me, finding signatures of life on there, kind of the environment on there, would just be the wish I would, I mean, that's how I would use my wish, kind of seeing that. And what's, what's following that? Once we know. All right, let's go visit. Okay. <laughs> I'm on board. Do we have, I hope we have questions from the audience. This is counting the same time now. Thank you. This has been really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I'm sure along your journey, you had some failures. And how did you handle those? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, let me just tell you, I did my, uh, so for, first of all, I barely made it into gymnasium. So all of you already beat me. Uh, I, uh, I barely made it in and uh, I, uh, I never had a grade below six, or what is your best grade? One or two, six? Six is the best. So I, I never had a grade below five and a half in math, and I failed the math exam into gymnasium because I was not well prepared. So I barely made it in. And then I finished my PhD, and I wanted to go to England because I felt I needed to learn English better. And I had a year's salary paid. I could not find a job. So I had a year's salary. I was free for a year, and nobody, I could not find anybody to hire me. So it's, it did not help my self-confidence a lot, you know? Like, here's a guy for free. Can he give you some help? It's like, oh, he's not good enough. <laughs> okay, so I was sold. No. Now, here's the thing that I observed. But I have a number of those things. I have, like, a whole cemetery of ideas that never worked. <laughs> Uh, kind of things that I've never worked on. By the way, that's how you find an innovator's house, a cemetery of good ideas, just so you know. But, but I want to tell you, kind of my observation, if you look back over my life, the failures or the no's were often the beginning of a trajectory that actually created to the, big, the biggest successes. So for me, yes, I had a lot of them, and it was, I was devastated by some of them. But you have to kind of... You just take my word, kind of keep your legs moving. Just try again, because karma is there for you. Like there's some odd, like there's another path that opens, and, and that other path is better. That's what I learned in so many, many different fashions, not just in my life, also many others. Thank you. And what with the team, you know, when you saw failures in the team that you had? Yes, uh, so, so the failures in the team kind of had, I would say, two or three sources, right? More often than not, it was weak leadership. Do you see kind of a, 
a leader that did not manage to utilize the team. Uh, sometimes the leader's name was Thomas Surbogen, right? So, so it's not like throwing rocks at anybody, right? It, it kind of doing that is, is really, really hard. Sometimes the problem was that, um, frankly, the team was not complete. We did not actually have all the skill set in the teams that we needed. And trust me, even if you do all of this right, sometimes you will fail. And what's really important for a team like that is that you give them a second chance. You talked about the landing of India on the surface of the moon. I will never forget um, that moment. I watched it live because I know the team and I know they failed before. And what happened when they failed, the leaders of India and of the Indian Space Agency said, good job, let's try again. And for me, look at the amazing success they created with that. So for me, I just the most important thing to take with us is success is not the absence of failure. You could be having no major failures and not be successful. That's a kind of a harsh thing, but, but like try something and be and fail, even as a team, but then come back and do it again. So, so for me, uh, that's that. Uh, that those are, I would say, the three areas. This industry is definitely failing forward. So, yeah, I know. Sometimes that's important. Go ahead. Thank you so much for your inspiring lecture. Could you expand a little bit on the degree of collaboration between different nations in your area? The beginning of collaborations. International collaboration. Yes. In, in I'm really area. glad that you're, uh, you're asking me that question because I felt I underemphasized that. There are many missions and many pro research programs that are bigger than one country or one continent. We need to do it as a, as a world. This is one of them. And so what happened there is that of the instruments that you saw the data, half the instruments were done either by Europe or by Canada. And, uh, and of course, the, the spacecraft was done, as we said, by the US. The rocket came from Europe. So the international collaboration was there from the word go. And uh, if you looked at all the missions I did at NASA, 130 of them, two thirds of them had international collaborations. And there are collaborations, the missions could not exist without it. I want to talk about one mission that I think is super important. Uh, that's a mission that measures the, the level of the, the, the surface levels of, of the ocean as a function of time. Like how, where's the, where's the water levels and how do they change over time? As you know, it's a huge effort. If you had a house next to an ocean, especially one that has hurricanes coming in from time to time, that's a really important uh, thing, if you wanted to write an insurance for that house, uh, those numbers really matter. Well, that mission is done by, U Europe is leading it, the US is helping. And frankly, I could not sell that mission in the US. You know, like you need to have a far view. I always say, it, like, you know, my European friends live in buildings that are 200 years old. I don't, I've never met an American who does, right? So, 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 so for me, that view, kind of that, that broader view, then together with technology enables that mission that's so important to understand our, our planet. So, so, so for me, international collaborations are not collaborations of the same, but collaboration of different that together enable, and James Webb is no exception. Another really interesting question that was submitted, the importance of the physical presence in a workplace to foster innovation. And I think it alludes to give it some flavor. It's a, it's a big question at Novartis as well with this beautiful campus that you saw today. And then sort of the pandemic, the context of are we as innovative when we work remotely? Yeah, and, and without a doubt, that question, the answer to that question depends on the industry a lot. So what I'm gonna give you is the answer uh, to NASA. So first of all, when uh, COVID happened, you know, like we immediately switched uh, to an online thing uh, just like everybody else, we tried very hard to stay on track and actually isolate entire teams. Uh, for example, we landed on Mars in the middle of uh, 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 COVID, and the way we did it, we created an airline independently of all the other airlines. Everybody was isolated, so, so we did that. 
Then, uh, once we were on the other side of the vaccines, you know, another just science miracle for me, uh, once we were on the other side of, of the vaccines, uh, uh, there's a number of organizations that stayed remote. And here's the data. So we measure everything uh, perfectly. We never found a hybrid organization that is uh, better than 80% efficient as compared to one that's in person. And part of it, so it could never do better than 80. That doesn't mean it's not absolutely not possible, but we tried everything and we could never lift it above. And so I think what that means in part is that the kind of, first of all, you can't build a spacecraft on the internet. So, so and, and it's basically you have a choice, like either we come together. I, I visited all the, the spacecraft teams in the middle of COVID. I visited them, they always said, look, you're the only boss that shows up. Thank you so much. You could, if you could create a kind of two society kind of company, like, oh, the workers work and everybody else is in their bedroom, you know, and it's calling in. And, and so for me, you have to be careful of that. The other thing is what we found, uh, there's one mission in my entire time at NASA where we missed the, uh, the, the launch, and I'm still annoyed by that. And part of it was is because people did not meet each other. Kind of when we did a review, uh, basically a lot of the younger people that were actually responsible there, they could not actually formulate that they had a problem so people understood them. And so basically what happened, the problem just festered and as opposed to wine, problems don't get better with age. You know, so it, it, just, it just, at the end, uh, kind of that innovative kind of meeting together in a coffee, it's like, how is it going? Oh, I have a struggle, like, well, tell me quickly. Like, that is no longer happening, right, when, I'm, when, when we're doing that. So for me, I think that's where the 20% come from. But it's interesting that you say it's, it's, it's relevant, depends on the industry, because just this morning, coincidentally, I read an article on LinkedIn that Zoom, the one company that really profited from us working from home, is calling their people back because apparently they're not building trust enough and they're like two days a week or something. And yeah. the other thing that was really interesting is that apparently the honesty is a different one when you have conversations remote, whether when you meet in person, you're, you're not as candid. Yeah, I'm not surprised by all of this. I think it's really, and, and, and frankly, at NASA, the people that wanted to come to work are the, were the young people because they said, somebody trained me. I'm in this yeah, job, exactly. like, who helps me get better? And, and they wanted to come there and, and kind of the, the people kind of my age or perhaps a little bit younger basically were not there. And frankly, uh, over time, as we talked to them, they of course said, yeah, it's my job to train, to train the next generation. Uh, yes, thank you. Hi, Dr. Z, I'm sitting over here. Uh, oh, here, sorry, yeah. Hi. Hi. Really nice to meet you, and thank you for your perspectives. Oh, my goodness, everyone's looking at me. Um, thank you for your perspectives and this talk. Uh, my family is a massive fan of your work, and really, quite literally, we've watched the launch, right, of the Webb telescope. We watched that rocket launch. Um, we would sit around the TV every year, um, numerous times, connecting the computer to the TV screen to look at all the beautiful photography that comes out of it. So I've just, you know, written to my family saying, look who I'm here with, right? And they're all really excited. <laughs> so, so really, thank you. So you had to do all that with the world's eyes on you, right? Including ours. <laughs> and um, you seem to work really well under pressure. Now we're all living in a very high pressure environment, um, including all of us, I'm sure, here. But what was your, you know, how did you do that? And how did you inspire your team to really push through together? You talked about the team and, and that's, that's so interesting. So how did you do that? Yeah, so, so I thought it was really important. Uh, by the way, I, I wanna tell you again of something, about, a detail about uh, the launch of the James Webb. I just wanna quickly tell you, you notice it's on Christmas day. Uh, there had never been a launch on Christmas Day by that company because they don't work on Christmas Day. <laughs> and it's a strong union. Uh, you can't force them to work on Christmas Day. We were gonna uh, launch the day before, and frankly, I did not think it was fair for me to ask, could we launch on Christmas Day? I did not ask him. I did not ask a single person. I basically said, well, wait until you're ready. So the union came together and voted and said, we will work on Christmas Day. 
without being asked. And I asked, I went to many of these people and thanked them. It's like, you worked on Christmas Day, thanks so much, you took time away from your family. And what they said, you know, this is the time I used my French. Uh, sorry, I had a three in French. Uh, not, not that really great person in, in French, but I used my French. I, I, uh, I went and uh, thanked them and everybody basically said, we did it for our US colleagues. We want them to be with their families too. And so for me, that was always the, the thing. That's what success is like in a team. It's not that you see just your own benefit. You do something for the other, not because it helps you. It's because it helps the other. And I was on that plane back from Guru, uh, back to uh, the US, everybody, and literally everybody was back at their homes that night after the launch. And I was, will be forever grateful uh, to these uh, uh, great people that are doing that. So I just wanted to tell you that story because it, it, it still moves me to today just because it's the generosity of spirit that happens in a good team. Uh, how do I motivate people? So first of all, uh, what I'm really trying to do uh, is, is do only my job, not theirs. So my job in this case um, is to make sure we do the international discussions, kind of we give it the best chance, the most successful uh, chance to, uh, uh, for success. Uh, and uh, frankly, what I'm ready for, if it doesn't go well, I'm the person standing there. Because see, if I take the blame right afterwards, the team has an honest to God chance to try again. If I'm blaming the others, we're not doing it again. We're going, we're stepping back by a decade or two. What really helped me are two things. Uh, the first, first of all is, when I took this job, uh, I tried very hard to bring my mentors with me. Those are mentors for me are friends that they're giving me advice because they want the best for me. They're not my bosses. Uh, they're not. They're, they're people who give me advice, and they always were my. They were people who told me you're wrong, or they're people who encouraged me in a moment like this. And uh, by the way, one of my mentors is the guy who failed with the James Webb Space Telescope. There's a lot of mistakes he made I did not make because he told me the mistakes he made, right? So, so, so that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is to recognize that for you to be a leader, you need to be healthy yourself. So I actually spent a lot of time working out much more ahead of the James Webb Space Telescope launch than normal. And the simple reason for that, I need to be healthy and need to be of good mind. Uh, the third practice that really helps me and, and I, it helped me and I really am a fan of it, it, I didn't invent, it's the Stoics in, in ancient times in Manet. And that is, uh, I used a lot of these practices head on, like uh, for example, visualize defeat so you lose your fear of it. Visualize it. Like, deal with it, like I knew, I knew uh, that if that rocket went to the water, my family would still love me. That was a huge comfort. I know I'm not gonna sit on this stage because I'm the guy who created the biggest debacle in space science, right? You don't wanna talk to a guy like that. But, but, but the point is, I, I was at ease. I was at ease because I knew that I'm fine, no matter what. And I did do my best. So for me, these practices, kind of how you do it, I, I, read some books, that, you know, some of these kind of ancient things, they're really useful, right? Kind of, uh, the, people figured out how to handle. So it's, it's really, I, I put those into practice. I, I would have never guessed how useful they are until I started needing them. It's also impressive in the documentary where you share that you always prepare for both speeches. Yeah. The one when it, project is successful and the other that's even more important and as a communicator like seeing that and, and seeing you actually writing those yourself that's very impressive so it's like you literally take your mind to what if things yeah. go down the drain and sometimes it really disturbs your yeah. sleep I <laughs> like after imagine. you're done with the speech I remember landing on Mars and we actually did I actually made the team do the whole press conference the negative one it's let's go through it like just so we all do this. I did not sleep well after that one. <laughs> like in the camera I said to you, and it's like, okay, it's like here's my speech that I wrote. Uh, it's like, you know, it becomes a little bit more real. 
but I think it's yeah. so important. Like it's totally. really lip. Ultimately, it's liberating. And I actually, I just talked to the athletes of the Swiss Olympic team, and I really recommend it. Do the same, because it gives you a lightness in life to try. Because you've imagined the, yeah. the negative thing, and you're not scared of it, because you know you can make it. There's a single failure here. I don't know if you recognize, but the time is not the actual time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're already above time, but here is a question that is steered to your current role, because mm -hmm. a lot of the questions were steered towards the NASA time. A question that a lot of us in this room, I think, uh, are bothered with, Horizon. We spoke a lot about uh, international collaborations. Yeah. What can we learn from your US experience for the universities and ETH in terms of collaboration? How do we get back to those programs? So let me just first tell you what I'm doing, uh, just a little bit. So, so the first call when I started at ETH, the first thing that uh, we noticed immediately, a lot of students came to me and said, we need an educational program in space. Uh, space is a $500 billion industry, and it's going to double in the next 10, 15 years. And uh, we have a lot of Swiss uh, people like me, uh, as a young me, uh, wanted to be part of that. So we're building that program. Next year is going to be the first class. And uh, my full expectation is that within uh, four to five years, we want to be the leading program in Europe uh, for that. Uh, not because we're doing it just at ETH, but we're actually stringing together the universities in Switzerland and taking the best of each and, and really building that. I'm so excited. I was just in Lausanne yesterday meeting with uh, APFL and, and so many of the amazing people. So we're doing that. We're also recognizing that uh, so many of the companies that we're going to need in 10 years don't exist yet. I fully expect that some of you will start some of these companies <laughs> in the front rows. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I actually mean it. I expect that. Uh, you know, of my uh, physics class in, uh, in, uh, at the University of Bern, a third of them started companies. I did one too. So, so, so that, I mean, try it and fail and then try again. So, so, so for me, uh, that's the second focus. So you, so you ask about uh, uh, Horizons program and remember, I don't know, I'm not a European politician. I pattern match American politics a lot more until recently. Uh, there's nothing to pattern match now. Uh, that's, that's logical. Anyway, um, but, uh, but the way I would talk about it is, uh, so first of all, I talked to a number of the leaders in Switzerland. All of them want to get back to it. Yeah. And everybody's trying to figure out how and kind of do it in a way that's politically viable for their corner of the world that they're serving. Uh, so I, as I, I would say, this, it, it's a, you know, England just got back. The UK just got back. And I'm fully expecting that Switzerland will also. Um, I also want to tell you that I believe, actually, Europe is suffering more from Switzerland not being in than Switzerland is. I really, I really believe that Switzerland is a, is a really critical uh, and strong part. And frankly, uh, frankly, what I really expect, and, and it finally happened that European scientists said, hey, we need the Swiss. And that's, that's I think, is the right word. So, so I'm far less worried about the Swiss. Uh, I'm a lot more worried about kind of the ability for Europe to really be as good as we can be if you start excluding people based on some kind of membership of one club or another. So, so for me, for me uh, we'll get on the other side of it, but, uh, but the, kind of the thing that I'm focused on is just really European leadership. Like, you know, how do we do the best job in Europe coming together? Europe is incredibly strong, but only when we work together. And so for me, that's what we need to do. And so it's in our interest to get back into that program. Could not be happier with your answer there. There's one question. It's, yes, I would say that, sir. Yes. The only question that was in the deck that I could have answered myself, so in case you need help, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42. Yes. <laughs> So we have one more for the audience and then a closing question. We have one burning question. Here's a guy. Oh, he, we have a front row question that needs a priority treatment. You can ask in the back too, or whatever.
Um, I'm very grateful to um, be able to ask this question. Um, and I wanted to ask, what was the most surprising discovery you made during one of your programs or projects, like with something you didn't expect? Because you always hear something, ah, oh, this was a theory, this was a theory, but something that nobody thought about and that was discovered. You're talking about James Webb or in general? Uh, in general. Yes, many. <laughs> Let me just take James Webb. Remember how I showed you that enormously old galaxy with enormously old black hole? Like when I saw that, I'm like in my mind, like I really would not have expected that. So basically what happens is we may have the story of black holes in the universe wrong entirely. It could be that before matter is even there, or right at the beginning, black holes start forming and are a much bigger part of our story. Black holes, we always thought, are kind of leftovers at the end. It may be that we're backwards. So for me, uh, that idea, by the way, not the first one who says that. Like, you can go read papers in Nature and others like, hey, we may have it backwards. So for me, whenever you get the logical connection wrong in something as big as the history of the universe, it's mind-boggling and incredibly beautiful. But there's many other. Uh, the second one I mentioned already is how many darn planets there are. Uh, I think it's incredible how that basically planets form in every star that we, nobody expected. I mean, fr frankly, that, I mean, I know kind of the scholars in that field. I'll give a third one. Do you know all building blocks of our DNA are already in comets and primitive asteroids? Like a lot of the proteins are already there. When I went to school, we always said, hey, uh, these kind of organic molecules that he's using for a living <laughs> to make medicines, you know, these things, uh, these things, uh, and his team, of course, he, these things, happened really late in the ev evolution of kind of the Earth and so forth. Oh no, they're already there at the beginning. So kind of for me, these three kind of, this, and that could rattle on, right? But all of these are just data that show you, oh, I was really wrong in uh, how we thought. And in all of these, if you take them together, what's exciting, if you just said, I don't know what the likelihood was of life when I started in the mid or late 90s, but I know the likelihood of life is probably a thousand times bigger today than it was then. That's how they come together. Thank you for your answer and insight. The closing question I have prepared has a reason. Get to that later. What was the single best and what was the most frustrating experience during your time at NASA? Well, I already showed you a picture of the most frustrating experience is sitting in front of a Congress <laughs> and being treated like you're a total idiot <laughs> and them being partly right, uh, but, <laughs> but, but partly, uh, you know, you take it to the gen and it, it is not, you don't feel like a hero that evening, you know, so, so, so it's frustrating and, and, you know, like, it's like, how, can I help that team get better? So it's really, fr there's multiple moments like this where somebody tells you it's like you're really, really wrong or, you know, or worse. Uh, the most exciting, I mean, for me, it's like you saw the moment uh, when, when this launch left, but for me also kind of landing on Mars are just moments where you just know there's no mistake happened. There's like thousand ways of doing it wrong and one to doing it right. And all of a sudden, you see the first picture from the surface of Mars. And I remember how it feels. You're sitting in the back row. You see the whole team. And they did it. And, and it's just incredible. You landed in a different world. And it's all autonomous. It's a robot. It figured its way out uh, down to, to Mars and doing it. So for me, those moments, right, uh, there's a, a handful of them. When we hit an asteroid, uh, I don't know what you saw, we deflected a celestial object for the first time. So we hit it, you see it zooming in. It's like it's totally autonomous and it's hitting. 
And for me, the woman who was in charge was my student, and she's doing it, you know? So, so she is in charge. So for me, these moments, these moments of immense success of a team that you're there, uh, those are worth, you know, years of my life. So, so I just really, those are the, the things that, that are there. Life is about moments. I picked this question because it didn't end there. It said, thank you for your answer. And today is Thanksgiving, so I want to thank you wholeheartedly. And for Thanksgiving, we all want to celebrate that together, invite you for an opera. Hope you stay a little longer for some informal questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.